I'm going to be incredibly brief because it would be impudent of me to take any time away from my distinguished colleagues and indeed impertinent for me to go through their CVs which will take all the time that's available to them for their uh, presentations. But first of all I think it's customary to thank the organiser at the end of conferences but I just want to thank Maxine and her team uh, for all the work that they have done. And may I, may I ask the British Academy to take note of just how, how much interest this whole conference has actually generated around the world, and also to take more than note, but to put some money into global history. <laughs> <laughs> the British Academy, as we all know, has a lot of money, some of which goes into more arcane, less relevant and less moral forms of history, and I do hope they can shift some of their budget I'm speaking to the people on the Grants Committee of the British Academy, which I sat for years without any success whatsoever, <laughs> um, to shift some of their funds in the direction of Maxine Centre at Warwick. I hope they will actually do that. <laughs> Second, I want to thank um, Miles Taylor for his very warm words about the IHR, and to pay, to pay tribute to two people who are here, or at, least, at least one of them's here. There was a lonely voice in global history in the 80s and 90s, and he's here today, and that's Felipe Fernandez Armesto. He was writing books, he was the Bill McNeil of British economic history, of UK economic history, and I think he sort of spotted the field long before most of us. The other person who spotted the field and got something going at Newcastle was of course Bob Moore. I don't know if Bob's in the audience, I hope he is, but he's run a very successful series for Blackwells. And I just want to make one third point, that Behind all of this shift, the intellectual moves that Maxine has talked about, there is a moral purpose to what we're trying to do. Most of us went into history with a moral purpose. What global history does for us is to teach us more about ourselves, our localities, and our nations, and our communities. There is no conflict between the local and the global. The global illuminates the local, and the local illuminates the global. And indeed, as Linda has so eloquently shown, it illuminates the life of a very distinguished woman. So there is, there is no conflict there. What we're trying to do with the young, what we're trying to do are two things, to make sure that the global is pushed into every history department in the world, preferably. Undergraduates who come to do history do some global history. That is the ultimate mission that we have set for ourselves. <laughs> and also to teach the young to think of themselves not just as members of a community or members of a family, but in the words of Diogenes, the guy in the barrel you remember, as citizens of the world. And I think if we come out of here with that moral message, and I'm sure we're going to get it from our distinguished panel, um, we will have achieved a great deal. <laughs> Linda Cobb. Thank you. 
at two levels. I want to touch in passing on some of my own experiences in thus moving beyond my initial area of geographical concentration. And I want to discuss as an example of narrative form the expanding genre of which the ordeal of Elizabeth Marsh proved to be an example, namely writings that seek to advance and interrogate transcontinental macro histories through some kind of micro-analysis of past individuals. Some years ago, Peter Kuklanis remarked that global historians seldom talk about people at all. He was being only half serious. But because some current modes of global history have evolved in close association with very abstract macroeconomic analysis, and because some of the subject's most distinguished practitioners have wanted to devise and write ambitious meta-narratives, it is sometimes assumed that global history must be concerned with human experience only in the mass and is not easily or viably conjoined with the recovery of particular people in particular <coughs> places at particular times. Yet it is neither accidental nor paradoxical that the mark shift in recent years away from viewing the nation state as the main or only key unit in history has been accompanied by a resurgence of micro studies as well as macro histories. I think not just in my own book, but of Vincent Caretta's transcontinental biography of a louder equiano, of Miles Elkborn's compilation Global Lives, or John Sensbach's study of a black 18th century missionary in the Americas, Africa, and Europe, Rebecca's Revival, or Natalie Zeman Davis's book on the travels and travails of Leo Africanus, or Maya Jasanoff's current work on the global diaspora of various American loyalist families, or indeed <coughs> of earlier works by Jonathan Spence, Leonard Blusset, and Leo <coughs> Spitzer. These are all writings that employ elements of biography, but that deviate from biography's traditional premise, namely that what makes a single life work chronically is that it was exceptional in some way. By contrast, these studies, and the many others like them, focus on individuals whose geographically ubiquitous experiences were connected with very much broader and impersonal processes. Smallness in these works becomes a site and a strategy through which to investigate the very large. One of the obvious appeals of this mode of narrative is its practicality. Single authored global surveys that stretch dramatically across time and space and multitudes have of necessity substantially to rely on and synthesize existing secondary accounts. If, however, you want to continue <coughs> writing overwhelmingly out of the archives, and if you are not working as members of the scholarly team, then using an individual or discrete group of individuals as your entry point for investigating transcontinental processes is one of the few feasible alternative strategies available. Moreover, and others have pointed out this, the task of tracking down past individuals across boundaries has been rendered infinitely easier <coughs> by one of the manifestations of current globalization. Because of the World Wide Web, historians and anyone else with a computer now have available to them an unprecedented wealth of manuscript and library catalogues, online documents, and genealogical websites from different parts of the world. I could not have written about Elizabeth Marsh had I not stumbled upon an online genealogical site that directed me to the remarkable archive of her uncle, which is still in private hands. Let me, however, make an important caveat like much else, this wonderful online bounty is still weighted very much in favor of the West. Few Asian or African archives and libraries can afford to generate comprehensive online catalogues, though some scholarly foundations are trying to rectify this. And even some manuscript collections
collections in Western archives that are conspicuously <coughs> full of riches for global historians, I think, for instance, of the Admiralty Papers at Kew, are often catalogued online only in a very skeletal fashion. In archival terms, then, what is perhaps more noteworthy than these new but uneven online riches is the way that writing the global history of individuals has encouraged scholars to revisit and reappraise some of the most traditional and well-known manuscript sources, wills, inventories, baptism records, bills of lading, ship's muster books, <coughs> manumission documents, etc. I think of how Vin Coretta employed Royal Navy muster books as well as baptism records, both to track Equiano's passages across the globe and controversially to cast doubt on his printed autobiographical claim that he had been born in Africa. I think too of how Rebecca Scott at Michigan is using all kinds of superficially very routine legal documents to track a black family from Senegambia in West Africa to slavery in San Domingue through the Haitian Revolution and on to emigration to Louisiana, then France and Belgium, showing, for instance, how various members of this family modified their chosen names and in the process their identities as they crossed oceanic and land distances. I mention these writings on black individuals who were driven across the globe as a result of wide-ranging historical processes, in part so as to make a more general point. Global history is sometimes accused of having a natural and innate tendency further to privilege precisely those regions of the world and those groupings that are already overprivileged in terms of wealth, power, and the historical record. To my mind, such claims are not clear-cut, nor are they an adequate reason to desist from seeking to write history adventurously across continental boundaries. But it would be irresponsible to ignore the fact that far more historical research has been allotted in the past to some places and some kinds of people and some human processes than to others. And that if global history rests only or mainly on already existing secondary work, then it runs some risk of duplicating and reinforcing these existing patterns of bias. This is another reason why historical writings examining the big and the in the small can be valuable. They can help to supplement the record. It is no accident, I think, that many of these recent global histories of individuals, if I can call them that, have had to do with the conventionally marginalized, with women, blacks, poor whites, the mixed race, slaves, etc. By incorporating such people and the places they come from more fully into narratives of global history, we can, of course, pose more inflected questions. For instance, there is a need, I believe, for more systematic inquiry into how far at different times and places different kinds of women experience global changes in the same manner as their male counterparts and vice versa. Being a female without paid employment certainly influenced how Marsh saw the world and how much of it she got to see, and in contradictory ways. For the first part of her life, her trajectory was determined by the males of her birth family who were mariners with the Royal Navy. And it was because of this that she moved from being conceived in the Caribbean to Portsmouth to time on the Atlantic Ocean and thence to the Mediterranean. Thereafter, Marsh's marriage to a member of an extrovert commercial dynasty connected her fortunes with long-distance commerce in four continents and three empires and involved her in land speculation in America and in forced exile in North India. It is unlikely that an equivalent male would have been dragged along in the wake of family members and exposed to so many terrains and seas to the same protracted degree. 
Conversely, few males tied down by paid jobs would have been able to set off on the expeditions that Marsh made in 1756 and 1772, first into North Africa and then into the eastern coastlines of the Indian subcontinent. Manifestly, this is a most unrepresentative case in terms of details, but that men and women could and can experience some of the same transcontinental phenomena in different ways or to differing degrees is a far more widely applicable point. Moreover, I come back to issues of serendipity. Tracking the diverse pro progresses of individuals across the globe, particularly perhaps non-state actors, frequently serves to uncover unexpected new data, which is of wider utility. Thus, it was only in tracking Marsh that I was made aware of the wide significance of the Isle of Man, a location rarely encountered in global history surveys. Before 1765, the Isle of Man was a quasi-feudal territory, not under the control of the Westminster Parliament, and consequently able to operate as one of the world's great smuggling centres. Dutch, Danish, French, Spanish and Swedish traders and more would offload huge amounts of European and non-European commodities, especially Asiatic goods, on the Isle of Man duty free. Some of these would then be smuggled into Britain and Ireland and from thence across the Atlantic. While slave ships from Liverpool routinely stopped off at the Isle of Man to pick up contraband goods for use as barter in West Africa. <coughs> that this significant entrepôt for global trade was closed down in 1765 when London imposed its fiscal control over the island prompts another consideration about the writing of global <coughs> history. The desirability of making room in it for the paths not taken and for the paths aborted. We all know that one of the appeals of global history now, not least to publishers, is that many of its themes seem to resonate with early 21st century preconceptions and preoccupations. The allure of such presentism can sometimes lead to global history writings assuming consciously or no a teleological, even a triumphalist and messianic Bent. Incorporating losers, as it were, both individuals and places, and those sites that at certain periods of time possessed wide international significance and reach, but then faded for some reason, becomes therefore doubly important. We have always, I believe, when venturing on what purports to be global history, to be sensitive to the limits different kinds of things. <coughs> I would agree with Tony Hopkins, however, that perhaps the most arresting topic that would-be writers of global history can probe is the cognitive component. In other words, the question of the ways in which people become conscious of the global as opposed to the international, the regional, the national, or the local dimensions of individual and collective life and how this impacts both on action and identity. One can, can pursue such questions, of course, by way of many kinds of narrative strategies. But focusing on an individual or a limited number of individuals means that the evolution of expressed thoughts and responses to matters globally can be tracked with a particular degree of <coughs> detail, depth, and precision. And I'd like to end my comments uh, by glancing at aspects of this. First, in regard to this co cognitive component, I would want to go back to my earlier point about the importance when writing histories of the global of looking at many different kinds of people, uh, not just in terms of origin, gender, ethnicity, class, but also levels of education, levels of articulacy. 
Jack Barson put it very well when he wrote that, quote, individuals and groups do not all see the same realities. And from those they see, they take hopes and fears that are not the same. This is not just a, a postmodernist position, far from it. When Renal and Diderot compose the volumes of their philosophical and political history, one of the points they made there was the likely gulf in perception in the face of the transcontinental changes they were analyzing between the sophisticated but sheltered on the one hand and the more perhaps unlettered and less reflective individuals who were active at the cold face. The contemplative man is sedentary, they wrote, while a traveler is either ignorant or deceitful. Um, this was a far too glib and crude exaggeration. But one of the challenges I faced when writing about Marsh was establishing in what terms an intelligent but self-educated woman of artisanal background who was sometimes upwardly mobile and who read novels was able to understand the different environments and transformations she was caught up in, what she perceived but also what she failed to see what she prepared to write down, was prepared to write down, and what were her silences. These challenges surfaced, for instance, when I had to write about her time in Morocco, which in the second half of the 18th century was a quite significant endogenous motor of change outside the West. Sidi Mohammed, the acting Moroccan Sultan, Marsh confronted, maintained close links with every part of the Ottoman world, and traditional commercial connections with Central Africa. But he also negotiated trade treaties with Western, Northern, and Eastern European powers, and ultimately with the new United States. Marsh was able to perceive some of this commercial and diplomatic and cultural extroversion in Morocco. She wrote of how the acting sultan drank tea, not coffee, as would long have been customary in his court. She noted that he drank out of Dutch re-export Japan cups, they were probably from Batavia, and that his favorites were dressed in Indian muslins, which may have come again from European traders or from Arab traders by way of Cairo. She wrote nothing, however, about African commodities in his court, uh, which were almost certainly there. Uh, was Marsh unwilling to acknowledge these objects, or was she perhaps unable to recognize them for what they were? Was this where Marsh's knowledge of the globe and its multitudinous networks stopped? It's important, of course, when examining cognition to look at men and women who stay behind or stay rooted in one location and not just at the movers and shakers, and this is true in all global history. The static, <coughs> the apparently rooted, have to be part of the subject. Again, focusing on individuals can be productive here because one can use their respective families as control groups, looking at those who move and those who stay. Thus, while mapping the quality of Elizabeth Marsh's knowledge and understanding and empathy as she crossed multiple boundaries, I was also curious about the knowledge of her uncle, George Marsh, who dealt through his work with every continent, but only once and briefly left England. His sense of the global seems to have been rooted partly in the Navy, but also and more intimately in various household objects and anecdotes a tea set smuggled in from Hamburg, a punch bowl made by an Indian artisan, Elizabeth Marsh's stories about Moroccan silver bracelets, the saga of a horse sent to a family member from Cairo, a diary written by a West African slave trader, and so forth. This family had a long tradition of cherishing evocative objects. <coughs> But as George Marsh himself recognized, the geographical provenance of his treasures 
was infinitely wider and more diverse than that of his parents' favorite household objects. And I think this is a, an area where historians can use inventories uh, with great imagination, looking at the different objects that households cherish over time. Uh, we all know about transcontinental trade uh, in basic commodities like tea and sugar and so forth. But you can drink tea and use sugar without thinking of the places they've come from. But when you select a favorite household object, that is likely to say something about your perception of different frontiers, different regions of the world. Clearly, if one looks at far more sophisticated and intellectually advanced individuals than the ones that I did in my last book, you get different patterns, you get broader patterns in some respects. One of the things I've been doing recently is looking at some leading imperial and political thinkers in the second half of the 18th century. Um, in regard to customary notions of what is called the gender panic of the late 18th century, the way that all sorts of thinkers are talking more about and writing more about masculinity, notions of women's sphere. This gender panic thus far has been interpreted almost solely in European and American terms. Yet it is quite clear from looking at the writings that what was informing this so-called gender panic, and it is a dreadful term, was not just observations of events in the Pacific, slave trade, events in India, uh, phenomena like the Hastings trial, but also the impact on white settlers in different parts of the world of different indigenous peoples and how their behavior can impact on white behavior and white assumptions in all parts of the world. So here's an example, it seems to me, where uh, looking at the thought of individuals can change a whole way of looking at a broad uh, historical pattern uh, and set of models. And this is really what I wanted to try and bring home. I don't think we should or can associate global history with a particular form of narrative. Uh, I don't think we should try. Um, it worries some people that global history may be just too much of an umbrella concept. Um, I don't think it worries me, not for the moment. Um, I see global history not as a particular genre, but as a mode of curiosity and consciousness and sensitivity that can coax us and encourage us to look at events and patterns in territories beyond our own chosen sphere <coughs> of specialization, and thereby render our understanding of past events sometimes subtly, but sometimes very substantially different. Thank you.